What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. Excited to be here today. I uh, want to apologize for the lack of an episode throughout the week. It's Sunday, and I'm going to go ahead and put this one off today when we get done recording it. Uh, Michael had a really busy week. I had a really busy week. Um, we didn't have a guest planned. Cameron had a really busy week, and it was just hard for us to record a podcast. And so I'm recording it today on a Sunday, which is, what's the date? The 11th. The 11th. Um, and it's rainy outside. No one, I guarantee, maybe somebody's fishing, but most people are probably at how, at their house enjoying a nice rainy day on the couch, maybe a little Netflix and hanging out. Um, but we're going to jump into uh, one of our favorite topics here in just a second, and that is uh, fall time topwater fishing. So kind of how to transition and change your topwater tactics a little bit and kind of where we like to fish and what kind of plugs we like to fish and how we like to fish them uh, as these temperatures start falling, as all these mullets start dumping out of the creeks and leaving um, for warmer water south of us. So um, we're going to get into that. Before we do that, we want to thank Explore Boatworks, which is one of our sponsors here on the podcast. Um, uh, they're just an awesome boat company. If you haven't checked them out, go check them out. They're built in South Carolina. They've got skiffs. Um, bay boats and they're they're working on some even bigger offshore boats as well but just real versatile um, real kind of cutting edge boat company so explore it's x-p-l-o-r boatworks um also go check out our facebook group on facebook it's eastern current fishing just a great place for you to connect with other listeners um, to ask us questions also in there just shoot us some topics like some stuff that you want to hear about this fall um, that we could do a podcast on we're always wanting to hear from y'all and kind of um, you know, pick our, where our shows go based on the seasons, but also based on what y'all want to know. So please either on Instagram or Facebook, just start dropping in some, some ideas of shows you want to hear, um, and, and some questions. And maybe we'll even do, I think this will be a good one. Uh, maybe next week we'll try to do this, but on Instagram or Facebook, if you're listening to this podcast, Le- uh, any question it doesn't have to do with any topic let's just do like a question and answer podcast where we'll have all these questions and me and michael just go through them so uh right now while you're listening to this pause it go over to instagram or facebook and and shoot us a- any questions you have um, that are fishing related and and we'll do a question and answer podcast um either this coming week or the next week for y'all um and once we get enough questions together that'll be kind of be the uh the, the tell or that, that's when we'll decide when we'll do it. But uh, please do that, and that'll, that'll be a fun one to do. Um, just kind of a, a broad, open podcast about fishing and, and what y'all. I'm just rambling and rambling about this. But um, so check out Facebook. That's where this all came from. And then uh, also, please leave us uh, a review on iTunes. Um, that helps so much. Um, subscribe to us on iTunes, and definitely go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, that's huge. It helps us grow and, and helps other people be found. Um, and I guess that's enough of that the pre-show stuff. I switched my uh, my studio around, so I'm usually recording with my back against that wall. But the more stuff like this that I watch on iTunes or on YouTube, I'm like, it's definitely more interesting to have like a backdrop and change my lighting up a little bit. So I hope y'all like this; it's not too distracting. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and start this podcast. We'll stop talking about stuff that doesn't matter and start talking about stuff that matters. Um, let me switch to this split screen real quick. Oh, it's not working. There's Mike. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk today about, you know, fall top water fishing. Mike, what do you kind of feel um, changes the most when it comes to, you know, the change of seasons as far as top water fishing goes? I think for me, it's a change in locations where I'm looking to throw my top water. Okay. So like during, during the summer, I'm really focused on grass lines. I mean, 10 feet, maybe off the grass line, I'm picking up the cast and I'm making it again. I'm not working that lure all the way to the boat when I'm like targeting redfish. Okay. Um, you know, as we start getting into this transition, we've talked about it before, you know, with the trout, I'm working that top water all the way back to the boat and I'm going to start doing that now too when I'm targeting redfish. So the redfish are starting to, they're not quite schooling, but they're not singles and doubles anymore. I feel like they're starting to kind of get into smaller groups. So they're not, they're going to hang out more in a little bit deeper water. They're, you know, a little, they're moving around a little more in that open water area. So definitely. I feel like a lot of fish this time of year, um, really start to, sorry, hold on. I'm trying to really start to stage up around the inlets and get off the beach areas where, you know, they're going to have large traffic, large traffic areas for mullet and bait fish that are migrating south. Um, that's why you start to catch a lot of fish on the jetties um, in North and South Carolina, 
in Georgia this time of year. Big fish, small fish. I mean, I've sat on the jetty before um, and caught like a 15 inch redfish on you know one cast, and then caught a 40 plus inch redfish on the next cast. And so it's uh, it's kind of funny, you know, that they're all right in there together. But that, I think that's the one time of year here, at least in Wilmington, that you can catch a puppy yeah. drum and a bull drum, you know, side by side. Uh, they're, they're just putting themselves in places and this is what fish are always doing they're trying to put themselves in places um where eat or feeding is easy you know where, where food is accessible easily for them and, and this time of year that's a lot of places and so you've got to kind of start to think about all right what's good ambush places for these fish and, and you know where are a lot of these mullet getting you know pushed around and sucked around and that's where i, th- I think points um you know in hard hard banks is is key like i was trying to catch mullet yesterday morning it was really tough for me the, t- the tide was, uh, you know, it was low. It was a, typically an easy time to catch bait. And they weren't really swimming on the surface super well. So I found myself a nice long shell bed on the edge of the waterway. And that was kind of pushing the mullet out a little bit more and making them swim up on the surface. And I caught on my bait right there real easily. Um, but, but just finding those areas, those high traffic areas for mullet, um, you know, with, with eddies and ambush points for them, I think it's key. And um, The cool thing about this, this mullet migration that we have every fall is, you know, fish are looking up. Like most of their feeding is going to be on the surface because of the fact that you know there, there's these mullet are moving through. And um, I don't know about you, Mike, but like the size of the mullet this time of year gets so much bigger. Those white mullet that that yeah. kind of grow up in our marsh throughout the summer, they grow quickly, and so there, there's some a lot of big ones, you know. And so throwing larger topwaters is not a bad not a bad thing to do. Um, I think Definitely. it can oftentimes be, uh, you know more effective for for bigger fish you know redfish and whatnot i feel like sometimes smaller top waters work better but for big trout like big top waters are, are key this time of year and this is a great time of year to catch big trout on top water there's not a ton of trout around yet but but um good fish will eat a top water this time of year well and two you were talking about the mullet migration like the mullet now are starting to I mean, they're always in schools, it seems like, but now when they're making those big runs to go out the inlet and stuff, you're going to see huge wads of mullet, yeah. and they're going to have to be pushed farther off the bank. They're just, they're swimming through free water. They're not necessarily concentrated right along the bank to be, like, protected, you know? Right, right. They're just in, like, migration mode. They're moving through creeks. I mean, yesterday, we were trying to catch mullet right up on the grass line. We, we were having a heck of a time, like you were talking about. Um, and we ended up finding a couple big pockets that just had big schools of mullet in it. And we were throwing on them there. So, and they were just swimming out in the middle of the creeks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're, know, they're definitely changing around their, their game plan of what they're doing right now. They definitely do, man. It's, uh, it's crazy how much bait we get. And, and you got to remember too, a lot of this bait isn't necessarily bait that was here this summer. You know, it's a bait that was north yeah. of us moving through, um, mm-hmm. And, and you start to see, you know, big pushes of them in the ocean. It's a great time of year to look for redfish in the surf, too. Um, yep. Because the mullet come right down the beach, and it's just, it's it's a highway for food for them. So, um, yep. well, cool. So, let's talk a little bit about, I think, first off, topwater choice. Like, before we even get out on the boat or out, you know, wade fishing or whatever we're doing, we've got to go to the tackle shop and pick up some topwater plugs and, and, you know, have them to fish if we're going to topwater fish. So take me through kind of your set of topwater plugs that you like for the fall. And then I'll do the same with mine. Um, most of the time I'm picking up like, um, I have several different ones that I've been throwing this past year. Um, I really got hooked on one of the Yozuri topwaters. It's just like their normal size, kind of like the normal Rapala skitter walk. Mm-hmm. But it's really light colored. It's not a bright white, but it's kind of a bone bottom and then like a tan top. Okay. Um, and a lot of times I'll start with that. Um, not first thing in the morning, but I'll have it tied on and I'll kind of switch from a darker top water first thing in the morning to that kind of once the sun comes up a little bit. Since the water's cooling down, we're kind of having some foggy mornings, a little bit of cloud cover, that kind of stuff at this time of year our top water bite extends past, you know, first light or the first 30, 45 minutes of the morning. So, right. you know, I'm trying that dark color to get that really good silhouette, something that they can key in on first thing. And then as the day progresses, especially if it's foggy and the fog starts to lift or the clouds start to, start to go away and the sun comes out, I'll switch over to that lighter color top water. Um, I like the, the top waters in that five inch range. 
um, are kind of what I'm sticking with most of the time. Mm-hmm. But I do have some big, like, six, seven inch ones that I will throw if I find really active trout that are showering mullet and that kind of stuff. Definitely. I'll switch over and throw that just to draw that one big fish or those few big fish that are in that group out. And don't be surprised to catch a 14-inch, 15-inch trout on a 7-inch topwater, you know? Yeah. No. They're going to come out and take a, take a whack at it, that's for sure. Definitely. I think one thing that that just made me think of, too, is, like, it is important this time of year when trout, when you know, when you're necessarily, not necessarily just targeting redfish with topwater, but trout, um, to have really sticky hooks. I mean, it's that's always important, but, like, the owner stinger hooks, I've actually got a packet. Give me one second. I'm going to grab this pack. Right. Yeah. And that that doesn't go just for top waters. I mean that's the thing is like jig heads, um if you're gonna be throwing mirror loops, make sure your make sure your hooks are super, super sharp. Yeah, definitely. This time of year the fit trout especially are finicky. Like you might find a school of them and you'll get six hits. This was my case that I had yesterday. You know, we were talking back and forth and you caught a couple and I had that classic trout thump before they just smashed it and didn't get hooked. Right. But as they're coming up and they're smacking it, you know, with the side of their face, trying to injure it, and then they'll come back and eat it. So without that super, super sharp hook, you're just not going to stick them very well. Definitely. And, and with the top water too, like you're saying, they come up and swat at it a lot. And so these owner yeah. stingers. The, oh, let me put it back on my camera. There we go. Uh, it is going to be hard to see on this camera uh, there we go um they are just great strong very tacky sticky hooks um uh, i put them on i paint a lot of top water plugs uh, in the off season i put them on all my plugs um this is a color that i made up this year that i think is going to work really well um, Ooh, i like that chartreuse little orange on the on the belly i've got a bunch over there i need a epoxy top coat but but playing around with colors key i i think that mm-hmm. you know Trout more than any other fish can kind of key in on a color. I've definitely seen it where I've never really seen it with redfish, where it's like where I can definitely say, "Oh, it's color." You know, you, yeah. one person might catch all the fish, but I've never had it really feel like it was because of the color that they were throwing it. With trout, I've been you know, a, you know, right beside somebody hitting the same stuff over and over again, where you know there's a school there, and one color keeps getting eaten better than the other one. So having an assortment of colors to throw, um, I think is important. And like the bone white you were talking about is a great trout color. Um, something with some gold and some orange, like a like a uh, gold mm-hmm. mullet like this, is a good color to have. I'm doing these silver. Is there top secret? I'll show them to you though. These uh, <laughs> silver with purple and black. Um, I think this is going to be a trout slayer this year. I got black. These like bead black eyes in them, which I think are going to be. Sorry for those of y'all that are listening. There's a lot of visual here. Um, but I think that's going to be a good color. But just having you know an assortment yeah. of colors, not just an assortment of different plugs, an assortment of colors. But then also, each plug, I really like the spooks. I mostly just fish different styles of spooks. But um, having different plugs with different pitches can really be important too. Like uh, she-dog, I've, I've seen where like a she-dog and a skitter walk, the she-dog's got that high pitch um, clack. I don't know how they get that. I think it's maybe a little heavier brass bead or brass ball inside of it, but, um, mm-hmm. or stainless steel. But that thing sometimes will just get annihilated by trout and you'll be fishing a skitter walk beside it or a spook beside it and it doesn't get eaten as well. So they, they'll yeah. key into noises, they'll key into colors. Um, and it, you know, I think they'll definitely key into eating larger baits too. Like this is this full size spook is, is a really good size for this time of year when there's a lot of big white mullet leaving the creeks. Um, yeah. and uh, it can be intimidating to throw, but then like Mike said, you'll get a 14 inch trout on it, you know, or 11 inch trout on it. You're like, okay, I definitely, if 11 inch trout's going to come up and try to eat that, I know a better fish will. So I think it's, is, is there any certain conditions? Actually, let's stay on the color a little bit longer. You, you said, uh, you really like bone white. What were some of the other colors that you were mentioning? Did you mention other colors that you liked? Um, I, I mean, I like to stick with like really natural colors. Um, I I like that dark back silver belly, yeah. um, color, especially to start out in the morning. Maybe some oranges or something in there. But um, as the day progresses and the light gets brighter, 
I try to switch more to those lighter colors, um, just to make it stand out a little bit. The the white the whites are just slightly off from like what the natural mullet look like from underneath. So I think that gives them a little something to key in on, but it still looks natural. Um, and then I'll even go with some translucent colors. I've got like, and this is a time of year where don't be afraid to go out and pick up some bass top waters and stuff too, like some translucent yeah. KVD kind of sexy shag colors, some of that stuff. Um, those fish, especially if you're going to be fishing clean water and not dirty water. Yeah. Um, I think that's something else to kind of, depending on which color or which water clarity and that kind of stuff you're fishing, you know, you kind of need to match that. So if I'm fishing dirty water, I try to stick with more solid colors, um, some with a little sparkle, a little flash to help grab their attention. But when it comes to the cleaner water, I try to bring my colors back a little bit, you know, stick more to the natural, more to the white kind of solid, um, white, just straight white colors, not anything super bright and flashy necessarily and definitely try to um, throw some translucent ones or not necessarily completely translucent, but, you know, something that's just more of a silhouette kind of look on the top. Yeah, definitely. I was just looking at Instagram right before we hopped on here, and Intercoastal Angler just posted some of the new Yozuri's. You were talking about a Yozuri, but um, yep. they're the Yozuri Top Knock, and they have a whole series of translucents that – they kind of mimic the colors that we see on the like the 3ds minnow and the 3ds shrimp. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could show them to everybody on here, but it's going to be hard to. Um, but it's uh, I'm going to see if I can airdrop it to my computer and, and share it onto here. But um, those translucent colors are, 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 are I think really key. Like trout can get very picky. Um, sometimes they don't care at all, but sometimes they do. And those translucent colors, I think, like you were saying, can really really uh, play a huge part in the cleaner water. I definitely don't throw the translucents much um, in the dirtier water. Like when I'm out fishing the New River, fishing the Cape Fear, I like a little more solid of a color. But in that clearer stuff, I think that translucents, you know, money. Because you got to think when a bait fish is swimming up on the surface, maybe not a mullet, but some of the anchovies and the glassy minnows and stuff that we have leaving this time of year, and that sun's coming down through them, they've, they've got to look a lot like that. Um, and when you were talking about color a little bit, it reminded me – of uh, my buddy Adam down in the Keys, who's a big tarpon fisherman, tarpon guide. Um, he, uh, I'm trying to pull this picture over here now. He's like, so you, most people fish worm flies for tarpon, palola worm flies. And so, and even if he's not fishing palola worm flies, uh, when he's tarpon fishing throughout the day, he, he has a pretty strict regimen of, one, he changes colors a lot if, if the fish aren't cooperating the way that he wants them to. Um, but two, he starts with those darker, you know, more silhouetted colors in the morning. And as that sun gets up, he goes to brighter colors like chartreuses and oranges and pinks and whatnot. And then kind of in the, in the evening when it starts to, the light starts to die a little bit, goes to those darker colors again. Um, and it, it works. I mean, yeah. kind of following that pattern for a lot of fish, for redfish, for trout, for striper, um, can be pretty, pretty helpful. Definitely. So. I just dropped in these Yozuri's from Intercoastal Angler. I hope they're showing up here. But the top knock um, baits are they're pretty sweet looking, man. The 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 top one on here, if you are watching, I really like that color for a 3DS minnow. It's kind of like a tan back with some spots on it. Um, and then this third one down that looks like a striper, but it's really it looks like a striped mullet. That color works really well. These are all great colors. The yeah. bottom one too is one I fish in the 3DS minnow as well a bunch. But I'm gonna pull that back off of there. So. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about cadence. Like color is important, and and what were you gonna say? Uh, I was gonna say while while we're still on colors and hooks and some of that stuff, um, I don't know if you do this, but I know like for me, I fish like an extra wide gap hook this time of year on the trebles uh -huh. instead of just the standard gap or whatever it's considered, where it's got that bigger opening. Yeah. Um. You know, you, you're going to have to play with especially your hard baits when you're switching out troubles and that kind of stuff. Some of them might not walk right. Some of them, you know, especially when you get into mirror lures and some of the subsurface stuff, if you're changing out um, troubles, you can get them to fall at different rates, fall a different different way. Um, so I'll play a lot with that, but I do like those those wide gap treble yeah. hooks. Thank um, you. They seem to get... I like that tip. Um 
they seem to stick the fish a little bit better. Definitely. So, and they're a little easier to get out, I think, after the fact. Yeah, some of the small little hard baits you fish for trout with trebles on them can be such a pain. Like that 3DS minnow gets eaten so well. If y'all have never fished the Ozuri 3DS minnow, definitely yeah. pick some up this year. Um, I was just in the intercoast angler the other day. They were stacked with them. Like, go get your trout tackle right now before it's like the floodgates <laughs> have opened and everyone's targeting speckled trout. Um, because nope. all these uh, big companies are having a hard time, you know, filling these orders of these shops. And so it, a lot of stuff's going to get bought out and it's going to be hard to find once the trout are really, really thick like they should be this year. Um, so go ahead and go pick that stuff up um, and try to support your local tackle shops as best as you can. Um, and don't order online. Go to the go to Intercoast Angler, go to Texas, go to um, New Server Bait and Tackle. Like wherever you are, um, definitely definitely try to shop local. And and I don't know all the shops in other states around here, but but it's, I think that's just an important thing is to, to support our tackle shops. So um Definitely. it's uh it's pretty key so um but yeah i think that's as far as the plug like there's not too much more to talk about um you no. know we've talked about color we've talked about the hooks we've talked about um i i think one another one other thing too is like keep an eye on your split rings um yep. they can get a little beat up sometimes and then your hooks will kind of hold in one area or um, you can bend split rings out as well uh, on some lighter plugs, but I'm um, just kind of keeping your hardware fresh. Like this is a great time of year to go ahead and grab your topwater plugs you're going to be trout fishing with and clean them up and, and put new hooks on them, put new hardware on them, um, and just get them, get them ready and also get out and once they're ready, fish them because it's time to be fishing them as well. So, um, we'll, we'll give, if, I don't know if most people clean their top waters or what, like I always use toothpaste. It has just a little bit of a grit to it, so yeah. it helps polish up the the finish on the top waters. Oh, that's and awesome. Get that rust and stuff off. So, like, if you are gonna start cleaning them up, like you can use toothpaste. Um, just give them a good rinse down afterwards, and it'll make them shine them up real good, and get their colors back. So, yeah. It's, and it's, another thing too is if you're fishing top waters. And you're not using a loop knot. Go ahead and learn a loop knot now, because loop knots are they're huge. Yeah. They give your bait a lot more movement and a different little wiggle and walk whenever you're working them than having like a uni or an improved clinch knot or something like that that's directly tied to the eye of the hook or the eye of your bait. So um, this is that time of year, definitely learn yourself a loop knot it, it can be something super simple you can get super fancy with it you know i have a very simple knot that i tie i don't even know what it's called but um yeah this is the time of year for that too yeah it definitely is it's uh it's key to fish a loop knot and and mono fishing mono when you're fishing a floating bait can be really important as well now if you're fishing a short piece of fluorocarbon um it, it really doesn't sink your plug I mean, I, I, a lot of times I just, I, I'm guiding, I'm changing between a lot of baits or if it's a top water that I'm trying to jig back on. It's like, I'm not going to change my leader every single time. If you've got a long stretch of fluoro in front of it, that could cause an issue. Uh, but I really don't see it play too much of an issue. Mono definitely helps. Fluoro is not going to kill your top water fishing. Um, and I just, the, the fluorocarbon now is just so much more durable. And so I just, I lose a lot of, I just worry sometimes hooking big fish with mono in their mouth instead of like having a flora bite section on it. So, I mean, I guess if you got crazy fancy, you could do like a mono with a little bite of flora in front of it, a little bite section for trout and redfish. I think that's maybe a little too, a little too much, but, um, but yeah, so well, let's talk about cadence, um, as far as, you know, how to work these plugs, um, and, and we'll get into, you know, the areas we like to fish at the end, but, but let's talk first about, you know, how um, and why I think that's kind of important like a pause it but why are we pausing the plug like when do we pause the plug when do we not pause the plug so Mike I'll let you start then I'll, I'll fill back in okay um alright so like, let's start with let's start with redfish fall redfish fall redfish I'm I'm never stopping my plug and then in the mornings, I'm not gonna work it super fast, but I'm definitely starting to pick it up. Like during the summer, I fish very lazy, slow walks, you know, with my top water. Not to where it's sitting still at any point, but it's just enough to keep that bait kind of shooting off side to side Yeah. when it's coming back to the boat. Um, but now that the water's starting to cool, the fish are getting more active, the water's holding more oxygen, so 
they're they're more on the hunt you know, and have the ability to, you know, really expend some energy because there is a lot of bait around and yeah. the oxygen levels are just a high as this water starts to cool off. Um, the fish are just willing to chase it more and they're going to be setting up a little bit more on that surface in the morning time. So um, I will start walking it faster and I'll vary it. So I might do three or four kind of quick twitches and then just slow it down just a little bit and then pick it back up. But for the most part, it's not like so fast that it's splashing everywhere right, or right. going crazy, but it's just enough that it's making a bigger disturbance than normal. Yeah, you definitely. know, or a bigger disturbance, especially if you've got a lot of mullet in the area, something to help draw in and let the fish key in on it. Yeah, definitely. So. One, one thing I always do too is like I, I kind of look around when I'm fishing in top water in the morning and try to figure out kind of what everything else is doing. Like, yeah. Are the birds really active? Is the bait super nervous? Is the bait kind of lazily swimming? Like, and, and I try to mimic that a little bit, be a little bit different, but kind of follow the the pattern of that day. You know, like all those fish are kind of feeding off of that barometric pressure, and and they're active, or their activities, and like you know how how they're moving around and how they're kind of starting their day is really you know all pretty similar to everything that you're seeing the birds, the um, mm-hmm. bait fish. Um, all, all that and so kind of mimicking that a little bit being a little different but uh, kind of trying to follow those trends I think can be important I've definitely seen times where you know bait swimming real slow and there's one guy that's fishing his topwater really really fast and there's one guy that's kind of a little bit slower little, he might even be not very good at fishing the topwater and that's why his bait's moving a little bit slower and a little bit you know more yeah. lethargic and he gets the bites and so um, keying in on those trends and they're not always you know they're not always true but find figuring that kind of stuff out day to day is kind of what makes you a better angler and sets you apart so Definitely. um yeah i'm with you too like I, it, there's like two thoughts as far as working a topwater plug um for redfish and that's like the fast retrieve and that's kind of like just triggering that reaction bite to get that redfish to come up and smash it and then like kind of that slow walk, spending a little bit more time in an area with that plug, trying to kind of milk a bite out of that area. So um, mm-hmm. I try to do typically both. Like I'll throw, if it's like a creek mouth and I'm like, God, that looks good. I'll throw one in there and kind of walk it out of there pretty fast. And I'll throw one in there and kind of work it out a little slower um, yeah. and spend some more time in there. So um, fit redfish this time of year are, are used to being, having to feed quickly and take advantage of the opportunity because these mullet, these big schools of mullet are coming through. But at the same time, yeah. You got to think there's so much bait moving on the surface that um, don't, if it looks good, maybe make where you normally make one cast, make two or three casts in there because um, the fish, yeah. if it's not the perfect cast form, you might be like, oh, there's going to be another mullet coming over my face in 0.5 seconds. So um, kind of think think about that as you're working in an area for sure. It's there's, there's even a different mindset right now for me of like during the summer, I feel like a lot of times I power fish. Yeah. So, you know, I'm spending five, 10 minutes in a spot and if I don't get the hit or don't get the bite, I'm moving on. Yeah. You know, this time of year, you know, I'm starting to slow that down, especially with trout season coming in because the trout are just so finicky that I'll spend more time in each spot um, and work, you know, work it a little longer. Definitely. So, you know, depending on where you're at and what your water temps and stuff are doing, you know, you're, I'm kind of switching depending on the day of how warm it is. If I'm power fishing and trying to move through some water and find that spot where those fish are sitting, or if it's a cooler day and I'm like, all right, they might be kind of grouped up a little more today, or they might be a little slower to eat and get going in the mornings, then, you know, I'm going to slow down and take my time and kind of pick it apart a little more too. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. With trout, I, I definitely start to pick things apart a little bit more. And with the top water, I'm not one to ever use a topwater as like a bait that I'm going to really go hard and, and fish an area really like I'll throw a topwater three or four times across an area and then I'll be like, all right, and then I'll pick up a DOA shrimp or I'll pick up a soft plastic. But there's guys like, like Ryan or friend Ryan Christopherson, he'll throw a topwater over and over and over and over again. And I'll, I might catch a few more fish than him, but he, all of a sudden he catches a friggin' six pounder, you know? And so yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's worth it. I mean, there's, there's just different styles and it's, it's good to fit like me and Michael, fish similarly but we also you know kind of have different techniques and kind of different confidence baits and so we'll learn a lot by fishing together like get yourself on the boat with more people um you know different people that you don't don't normally fish with and you can learn from each other 
Uh, I think that's key. And I've learned a lot um, about trout fishing by fishing for trout with, you know, different people that have different techniques that fish different areas. So um, yeah. don't just get married to one soft plastic color. Don't just get married to one top water color. Kind of play around with it. Play around with your retrieve and um, hopefully you'll catch some more fish that way. But all right. So we kind of talked about redfish and trout and that. But with the trout, I think the one big piece that we're missing is kind of like, the pause and and the pause in a retrieve and so uh for myself when i'm working a topwater plug for a trout like a lot of times i'll just continually work it until i get popped and missed and then i'll pause it um and then if i start if i catch a fish like that then i might start actually doing my retrieve like that like click clack click clack click clack click clack pause click clack click clack click clack click clack pause like I, i don't normally start out that way i normally just start out with a straight retrieve um, mm-hmm. of walking the dog and then I'll pause it. But that's kind of, uh, that's kind of how I go. Do you, when you're trout fishing, are you one of the guys that like is going to pause it every cast? No. You're kind Typically, of, I don't, I don't know. I just never really pause my top water, even with trout, unless I get swirled, I'll pause it. Like it got stunned when it got hit. And then I'll do like a half a twitch just enough to get the bait to kind of shoot across and kind of, you know, awkwardly walk. Yep. And then pause for another split second and do that once or twice. Like it's just kind of coming back to life, yeah, you know, a little yeah. bit. And then I'll start walking it again. And a lot of times it's not that first twitch, but that second twitch or right when I start to walk it again, those fish will come back and hit it again, you know? Heck yeah. Um, so, you know, it's – and like I say, I, I only do that for trout. If it's a redfish or something like that, never stop it. Just work it, work it, work it, work it. Even when it gets hit. You know, I keep working it because those mullet, they just seem to try to scoot away as soon as they can or, you know, as fast as possible when they get hit um, by a redfish. Or, you know, a redfish isn't come up and swatting at it. It's chasing it from behind versus a trout or more ambush from underneath, you know, coming up and hitting it. So it's a little different feeding that you're focusing on there. So Yeah, definitely. I- I've watched a trout, too, before that's eaten the bait four or five times the way back to the boat. And you can see them underneath the yeah. plug. Like, he'll come up and eat it, and then you're letting it sit there and twitch, 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 let it pause again. Bam! He eats it again, and he misses it. He's underneath the plug. I mean, they'll, they'll literally stay a foot underneath it and kind of track it. So, yeah. um, I, I don't know if maybe they're sitting there waiting for it to, like, you know, try to swim back down underwater and they're going to eat it or what. But they they get some, you know, pretty pissed off when you let it sit there in their face for a second. <laughs> um, you can definitely let it sit too long. Um, you know, I, I usually – how long would you say you pause it? I, I'd say I pause it for – this time of year, a second, maybe. One yeah, Mississippi. Exactly. Um, I've been fishing with Ray, Captain Ray Britton, who's been on the podcast a bit, Spring Tide Guide Service, and he, um, when it gets cold, he'll still throw a top water, but he'll let it pause for five to seven seconds sometimes, ten seconds even, like, uh, oh, and, wow. and have those fish crush it uh, like eight seconds into a pause. <laughs> I think it's yeah. like you're they're sitting there, sitting there, and they're like, oh, my gosh, i got to eat this thing, you know? <laughs> and like, it's not going to move. I'm going to eat it. So, uh, but that's and, to me that's the big difference for the really the only difference between topwater fishing for redfish and trout. Yeah, and I, too, and this is something that I've kind of focused on a little bit last year is if I'm fishing a topwater and they're kind of smacking it and like you say like chasing it but not really committing to it. That's when a lot of times I'll pull out like a different type of hard bait, you know, yeah. a mirror lure or some kind of little subsurface or a super light jig head, like a 16 jig jig head with a Z-man on it. Yeah. Something that's just going to get underneath the surface and be there for them to come up and hit um, and work that. So, you know, the fish will tell you what they want if you read into it a little bit. Definitely. So. They'll definitely tell you what they want. It's, uh, yeah, it's, man, the topwater fishing forum, you just can't beat it. I'm just sitting here thinking. No. The whole time we've been talking, I've been playing all these different spots through my head. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get to the top water there. I can't wait to get to the top water there. Um, it is, it's here. It's time. But um, let's talk a little bit about conditions now. Um, I yeah. think that and, – and with that, th- this is going to be our transition here. So cadence based off conditions. Uh, one thing that I've really learned over the past couple years is do not be afraid to throw a top water plug when it's windy. Uh, you know, th- I think there's times where – you don't need to. It could be too windy, but they fish eat a topwater plug sometimes better in some slop and in some chop a little bit. 
Um, if you're having trouble working your topwater plug when it is windy, try a larger plug. You know, it's already gonna break that profile up a little bit, so it won't look quite as big to the fish, but that larger plug with a bigger keel is gonna walk better. Um, yeah. And especially trout, like some good texture on the water, they love it. Um, you know, and it, I've found too, and we've talked about this on recent podcasts, not recent, but podcasts from this summer, the wake bait. When it's really, really calm, a wake bait is killer. So definitely get yourself some wake baits. Um, yep. it's, a, it's another bass bait, as, as most baits, that has made its way into the saltwater world for redfish and trout. But um, it looks like a crankbait. I've got some sixth sense wake baits, but there's a lot of great companies out there. Just type in saltwater wake baits um, online. And, and there's not a – tackle shops around here really don't have many. Uh, I don't – or any at all. Um, but, but definitely uh, – I'm trying to see. I don't have a wake bait in here. Um, but but they're just a, a great bait to kind of change it up, and, and especially in those calm, slick conditions, a wake bait is pretty clutch because it just pushes a small V off the front of it just like a mullet does. And um, yeah. I have not fished a wake bait. I've caught trout on a wake bait throughout the summer, but I haven't really fished it, you know, on a good topwater bite for trout. So I'm excited to do that this fall. Um, just don't, don't let yourself get out there and wish you had something you didn't. Like, go to the tackle shop. You don't need to get 50 of everything, but, but have a nice – you know, selection of different baits to try. And it's nice when you're fishing with two or three people because you can all throw something different and kind of learn your, your process of learning is shortened because you're all throwing different baits and you can kind of figure fish out a little bit quicker. It's not just you that's sitting there on the bow having to retie and try different topwater color, different plug, different style. Everyone can kind of work, um, you know, their own cadence, their own plugs and, and really figure those fish out a little bit quicker. So, um, yeah, don't be afraid to fish with some buddies. And I think, I think too talking about cadence and I maybe you're gonna bring this in later I don't know but um I feel like during the summer I try to work my bait kind of with the current a lot of times and this time of year I just throw that out the window I work it sideways I work it down the grass bank I work it with the current with you know against the current yeah. all kinds of different directions and that's gonna change your cadence a little bit too but changing those directions are in the way that your bait's moving um, with and against the current a lot of times can make a huge difference. It's not as big in the top water part, I feel like, as it does when you get into jig heads and saw plastics and a lot of your subsurface baits. But um, it still can play into it for sure. But, yeah it, yeah, it definitely can make a difference. So, you know, work – if you know there's fish there and you didn't get them on the first, like, two hits – Maybe not may you know move spots, but change, change angles, angle yeah. or your presentation. That's um, a good point. Changing angle is huge. I mean, and, yeah. and we've learned this from being sight fit guys that like to sight fish. Like you, you yeah. throw a cast to a fish at the wrong angle, and it could come right past his face, and he decides not to eat it because it just you know it wasn't the right setup. And again, this time of year, there's so much yeah. bait out there. Like, why not? Why eat something if it's not perfect? You know, like they they're gonna ha- they're gonna have multiple multiple opportunities you know, throughout the day to, to eat mullet and to eat baits. And, and so playing around and trying to get that right presentation, right angle, right cadence is key, you know, really, really key. Yeah. Um, more so with trout than redfish, but it is definitely true mm-hmm. for both of them. So, yeah. um, so what conditions do you like to look forward to throw top water this time of year? I mean, even when it's like calm, isn't my favorite time to throw top water just because I feel, and that's where the pause I feel like comes in a lot more into play for me Yeah, is, you know, just kind of keeping it quiet and, you know, letting it sit there a little bit, but I like, you know, light breeze, light texture on the water, just enough that it's breaking up the surface. That's kind of like, I feel like that's the prime conditions. Yeah. Um, you know, once you get into the creeks and stuff, there's enough current moving that it kind of always keeps the water textured a little bit. Yeah. So unless the wind's just absolutely howling, you know, I feel like you can always throw top water in creeks. But when you're getting out into bigger water or around the inlets and some of that stuff where you've got, you know, a wide, wide area for the wind to really be able to affect it, um, a little bit of texture is definitely, you know, I feel like the best. Yeah, So definitely. And... If you're getting into like one foot rollers or something, you know, where it's just really nasty. I mean, me and you fished last year. There was days we were running on the intercoastal, you know, it's two foot swell in the intercoastal. And we're sliding off these little corners and stuff right where the water started to calm down, throwing topwater and catching trout like that. So, you know, 
pick and choose your areas and you can kind of change around location to get the water you know top that you or the surface conditions you want yeah definitely um, um i think that too uh i mean this plays true throughout the year but um lower light conditions so if you start early in the morning definitely throw have somebody throw in a top water you throw a top water for a little bit have two rods tied up like Trout fishing yep. and, and fall fishing, I think, is important for redfish or trout to have a few different rods set up, have them by your feet, feet so you don't have to retie. You can fire a cast in there with a top water if you didn't get what you wanted out of there. You know, pick it up, throw a shrimp in there, throw a jig head in there, and, and be able to cover that water quicker that way. Like all, you're always trying to just speed up the process of finding the fish and getting the fish to eat. So, um, yep. but but yeah, that I think that's pretty key. What else was I going to say? We're talking about the conditions um low light so low light is 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 important but it doesn't necessarily always like once i get a little more into the fall like i'm not afraid to throw a top water later on in the day i think that has to do with the amount of bait that's pushing around on the surface throughout the day i also think it has to do with the water temperature being cooler the fish aren't quite as lethargic in the middle of the day and they're more yeah. active to feed and um so don't be afraid to continually pick it up throughout the day. I'm not saying fish it from sun up to sundown, but just pick it up and throw it. If you're in a high percentage area, or your area that you're like, oh, that looks good, you know, throw a top water in there, and yeah. let it surprise you how, what 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 kind of fish will come up and eat it. But um, also cloudy, like if it's cloudy throughout the day, even in the middle of the day, um, that's clutch. But one of my favorite things in the fall is like when you get a, a pressure system like a like a nor'easter coming through, and it's about to rain, and the temperature's about to drop. Go throw a top water like that is the freaking. That's the time to be trout fishing in general, but like the the next big cold front we get, the oh, the yeah. twelve hours leading up to the temperature actually starting to drop, like big fish will choke top water plugs right then. So, whatever you're doing, whatever responsibilities you have before our next cold front, um, <laughs> get rid of them and go go trout fishing because it's gonna it'll get good. And an area where you're like, I don't think there's any trout in here, you'll be like, holy crap, there's a lot of trout in here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, it was funny you said that because I was sitting here thinking the same thing. Like, this is – like, yesterday wasn't a terrible fishing day, but it wasn't a great fishing day. Like, you could just tell the fish weren't quite there yet. Right, like, they're, yeah. they're there, but they're just not ready to feed. And I think that had to do with, like, a little bit of rising pressure through yesterday, a little bit of clearing up of weather. And then, yeah, of course, they had this weather front coming through, but we kind of hit that nice weather window – not to say that fish won't feed during then, they definitely will. I mean, we all caught fish yesterday, but you can tell even there's just like a two hour window sometimes during the day where the trout just go crazy. Yeah. You know, and it's definitely. got to do with that weather change and the pressure change. So, and, and I think there's fish here right now. I don't think there's the, they're not all here by any means. I mean, no. the ocean temperature is still warmer. The art, I mean, there's a lot of fish still migrating down that are in coming through it it's a great time to go ahead and start surf fishing too because these fish are pushing down the beaches um, yeah but yeah it's it's uh it, it was a tougher day yesterday i think on the trout i mean we caught trout like we said but it wasn't it felt like there was more in there than there were you know what i mean um, yeah so we'll see i think i really do think with this next front will it'll be good and, and also too regardless of how many fish are there or not we've had crazy weather lately where we'll have wind and, and everything out of the north one day and the next day it'll be out of the south and the next day it'll be out of the north and the next day it'll be out of the south and it kind of is just throwing these fish back and forth they're trying to get on a pattern and and on a bite and they're, they can't when the weather keeps changing like that and the barometric pressure keeps flipping on them so um keep that in mind as well two to three days of consistent pressure and weather is key for fish like the the perfect storm is two or three days of consistent pressure and weather moving into a cold front so prefrontal on a, um, a new or a full moon. So like five, three to five days before and after a new and a full moon. If you can put all those together, trout will. That's all I'm gonna say. Trout will. <laughs> <laughs> trout will freaking be there, and you can catch them. So I'm not gonna repeat that, but you can rewind it and listen to it again, and uh, definitely just constantly be looking at the conditions and, and look for that little little pattern i mean that is when you will always see on instagram so many citation speckled trout posted and caught around those conditions and those moon cycles so moon phases um yep. I, I think that's all i really want to touch on with the the top water fishing can you think of anything else um 
I mean, just if you want to go over a little bit of location, like, are you changing anything? Because I know, like, we talk a lot about, like, fishing points and current seams and stuff coming together, bigger water right now. Are you are you starting to move into creeks? Are you starting to do any of that? Or are you still kind of holding in that bigger water? Um, it's Everything's still focused around bigger water, for sure. Yeah. Um, they're, they're getting in some creeks and stuff around the edges, but um, around that bigger water. But... but definitely still focus on that that bigger stuff like they don't really move into the tighter deeper stuff until the water temperature gets cooler they'll kind of go up in there because that's where the bait's coming from but they're not going to be piled up in those areas so um you know another big thing too is around structure like fishing heavy structure fishing oyster bars fishing old docks with you know current coming through them can be very important and very productive um like by old docks i just mean old pilings and you know junk piles like i think of a lot of areas where there's just like old riffraff and rocks and like some old pilings laying down like those those areas big you know big current swirls and eddies from crap underwater those are great areas to throw a top water um but for the most part it's it's the same as the last couple of trout podcasts we've talked about for me you know it's like the trout are in the same the, the, the area doesn't change because of the bait that i'm fishing really it just the, the conditions and the time kind of dictate what I'm going to be throwing. So, yeah. Well, I think like for me right now, I feel like a lot of it's tide based. Yeah. Like low tide, you know, there's still deeper water than those fish are going to be holding there. But I feel like sometimes when the lo- lower tide comes, they kind of drop into a pocket or drop into a hole and they sit there and they're still feeding. They'll still eat, but they're not as active. Right. Um, especially this time of year like that two to three hours of you know last bit of incoming around high and the first two or three hours of dropping tide once that current kicks you know kicks in on either side of high tide i feel like it's kind of my key time no matter what time of day that kind of is you know i try to put that together with you know an early morning or something you know it's preferable but you kind of take what you get so you know even even though like I want to fish trout first thing in the morning for top water, like I'll go do that in a couple you know deeper water spots, and then I'll go do something else and then come back even if you know if the high tides in the middle of the day and start fishing those spots again because I know those fish are going to either move back into there or you know now they're going to be a little more active to feed because now the mullet's coming over them a little better or whatever the case may be so. You know, if you go in and you fish a spot and it's low tide or mid tide, and you're like, I know there's trout here. There was trout here last year. Don't be afraid to hit that spot. Spend 15 minutes in it. Go fish something else and come back and hit it two definitely. hours later with a little That's bit good. of a different tide window. So, because it, it definitely can be a tide game right now, too. Yeah, and when you do catch fish really well in an area, some spots it doesn't matter the tide. Some spots it really matters the tide. So, pay attention to yep. what the tide's doing. And if you go back to that spot two days later and you don't catch them, try going back on the exact same part of the tide. Don't worry about like what time of day it was. Worry about what part of the tide it was because that's when those fish this time of year. I mean, the trout are going to feed all day this time of year. It, it really doesn't yeah. doesn't matter. So the tide windows is what's kind of pushing these fish around. That's good. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so, yeah, I think that's key. I mean, Get out there and uh, and throw topwater plugs. I mean, obviously the areas where we're targeting trout and where we're targeting redfish are very different, but it's a good time of year. I mean, fish are looking up. A lot of the bait that they're keying in on and feeding on is up. I mean, there's a lot of shrimp coming through as well right now, too, that they're feeding on. But, but those mullet, I mean, they want big, quick, easy meals. Those mullet are money. So um, go throw yeah. a topwater plug. Don't be afraid to throw a big topwater plug. And, uh, and send us your pictures if you catch some big trout and redfish this fall and post them on our Instagram. So, well, Mike, thanks for uh, thanks for doing this podcast with me as always, and uh, we will see y'all in a couple days because I'm posting this one right now on Sunday, and we'll see you again uh, this week. So, later. <laughs>